<clears throat> okay, Dr. Stig, you can get started. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me, Roseanne? Yep, all good. I want to make sure my voice is okay. We're not on, we're not on mute. Hello and welcome to everybody. I want to thank you for taking time to join this webinar as part of the This Is Your Brain webinar series. At the same time, I'd also like to invite you to listen to This Is Your Brain, the podcast, which can be found on your Apple podcast, uh, highlighting all aspects of pursuing a brain healthy life. What we're going to focus on today is a, a process called hemifacial spasm. <clears throat> uh, which uh, on the next slide will demonstrate what is hemifacial spasm or what do I have? That's the question that you as a patient should ask when you go see your doctor. And they should be able to explain to you that it is an intermittent spasmodic contraction on one side of your face. It may also lead to excessive tearing on that same side. It typically occurs uh, around the eye initially, but then can progress to involve the entire face, more commonly from the eye down to the lower face, but also your forehead can also fasciculate or twitch. The important thing here in terms of differentiating it from other types of spasm in your face is that it does persist in sleep. We tend to see this more commonly in the female uh, gender, and it may be associated with altered uh, facial pain uh, and altered hearing. On the next slide is a picture of what this means, and some of you that are experiencing this will recognize this. Uh, when I see you in the office, uh, this is the more extreme form where the eye as you can see on the right side of the patient is in spasm and the right side of the face is drawn up. The forehead uh, can also wrinkle a little bit more. <clears throat> in uh, uh, more chronic forms, patients have frequently uh, had Botox injections and we will actually see that there's a flattening uh, of the nasal labial fold on that side and there might be a little bit of atrophy of that side of the face such that it looks asymmetric. On the next slide, what does it mean to have it and are, what are the causes uh, for hemifacial spasm? <clears throat> this is most commonly, most commonly related to a vascular compression. And there are several blood vessels that go in this area. It's the posterior inferior cerebellar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, but there can be a large looping uh, vertebral artery or a basilar artery pushing on what is called the root entry zone or the area where the nerve enters into the brainstem. There can also be idiopathic uh, a, a hemifacial spasm where we, we, we don't really know what the causes are. <clears throat> You'll see on the next slide what the workup is, but as we work this up, uh, I'll go back to the previous slide please. As, as we work this up, we get MRI scans and we have to rule out that there's a tumor or a cyst or that the patient has MS. MS is usually uh, a, a syndrome and we can get a diagnosis with other factors uh, as part of that syndrome. Some patients after they have a Bell's palsy, which is a flaccid weakness of the face, uh, usually due to a viral infection, uh, post, post palsy, they can have hemifacial spasm. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, one of the things or several of the things that we need to differentiate hemifacial spasm from is uh, uh, just routine blepharospasm, which is different. It's twitching of the eye only, and it seems to be exacerbated or accelerated when the patient comes into the doctor's office but when they go home, it's diminished. So obviously anxiety plays a role. And then there's facial my myokemia, uh, where there is a mass in the brainstem, and one of those masses can include multiple sclerosis. On the next slide, <clears throat> I talked briefly about 
what are the imaging techniques that we like, like to use. And for me, the most important image, which I'll show you in a moment, is what's called a, an MRI with Fiesta imaging. And this is a technique that accentuates the brain water around uh, the brain stem, and it highly demonstrates the cranial nerves as well as the blood vessels that are near them. On occasion, uh, we will also use a high definition MR angiogram to see whether the blood vessel is directly abutting the seventh cranial nerve. Next slide. And this is an MRI scan with Fiesta imaging demonstrating, as you can see, this is the internal auditory canal through which goes the two vestibular nerves, the cochlear nerve and the seventh nerve. <clears throat> the seventh nerve is usually on the dorsal aspect, as you can see right here. And you see this black line, which is the blood vessel. Because of the blood flow, here's your basilar artery. Blood flow on this type of imaging comes up as black. And with this, I can differentiate and see that the uh, uh, blood vessel is directly abutting the seventh nerve. <clears throat> On the next slide, I want to talk about once the diagnosis is made, and the trick to being successful at this is making, number one, an accurate diagnosis, and then number two, picking what is best for the patient. And we will frequently recommend that we you start with Botox injections and see whether uh, that provides prolonged relief. If you, get, if you get that prolonged relief, it may be reasonable to continue with that. However, you need to remember that Botox is a poison <clears throat> and it, it's a toxin for the, blood, uh, for the muscles of your face. And with repeated usage, you can get atrophy. And as I said earlier, you get loss of that fold in the nasal labial region of your face. And so there can be diminished activity on that side of the face in contrast to the hyperactivity related to spasm. The technique that I like to use for this, and really it is the only therapy that's, uh, uh, that, that has a positive outcome, is something called microvascular decompression. And it's successful in 80, about 80% 80 of the patients and in another 10% it gives partial relief, and there's a 10% failure rate. We're not quite sure why uh, there is a failure rate. <clears throat> uh, part of it can be that when you do get in there, the MRI scan and your interpretation of it were slightly inaccurate, and there wasn't uh, pure compression. Uh, 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 part of it may be that the, the nerve has been so injured as a result of the repeated pulsations uh, that by taking the blood vessel away, uh, the scarring is still there, and so the abnormal conduction that is incurring within the uh, seventh nerve, the facial nerve, uh, persists, and so you don't get better. It's also important to notice that when you do do a microvascular decompression, the relief that you get may not be immediate. You might have to wait several weeks to start, see relief, start to see relief, and also the relief not only might not be immediate, but may be partial, and then it can progressively get better. <clears throat> and there's always the risk of recurrence, which uh, in large patient series uh, occurs about 10% in 10% of the population. On the next slide, we demonstrate here what it looks like in the operating room. And this is a view from uh, uh, on the patient's right side. And as we're looking down into that angle, what's called the cerebellopontine angle, and where the nerves are going into the internal auditory canal, we see the eighth nerve uh, uh, between us and the seventh nerve down here. <clears throat> we have intraoperative uh, techniques for stimulating the nerves to confirm uh, and allow us to differentiate. But you know, after having done thousands of these, it uh, becomes pretty obvious what the nerves are. And then we start looking at the vascular relationships. And this is a branch of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, uh, and the, the two ways that the seventh nerve can be compressed is we see a blood vessel going between that crease of the eighth nerve and the seventh nerve, or we can see uh, a, a blood vessel going deep underneath 
and it pushes the seventh nerve up towards us, or there can be a blood vessel coming along this root entry zone. Uh, these are all the uh, aspects, and there can be veins as well. Veins are easily taken care of. They can be cauterized. From a surgical perspective regarding the risks associated with the procedure uh, is when the blood vessel is going between the seventh and the eighth nerve, it means that we have to manipulate the eighth nerve, and part of the eighth nerve is the cochlear nerve, which is responsible for hearing. And so with that, <clears throat> one of the complications can be uh, a partial loss or loss of hearing uh, on that side. In the next slide, oh, yeah, here is the other example that I was showing you is that the blood vessel is going deep uh, and there's another little branch looping into the root entry zone. So with this, in this scenario, we have to put the piece of Teflon coated felt here between the larger blood vessel and the nerve, but then we also have to put a smaller piece uh, between this blood vessel and the nerve to make sure that it is completely <clears throat> decompressed. The important aspect of this is again, having somebody that's done this uh, many times, to make sure that we're not that they are not only look at the root entry zone, meaning where the nerve is coming out of the brainstem, but also all the way out to the internal auditory canal to make sure that there isn't a smaller vessel branching in that area. So what are the risks associated with this? As I said, depending upon the anatomy, there can be a, 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 a risk of, of hearing loss which is, is not uncommon because the cochlear nerve is extremely fragile and patients with hemifacial spasm will frequently note that they've had some partial hearing loss to begin with. Uh, uh, however, in 13% of the patients, there can be complete and in 15%, there can be a partial hearing loss. Facial weakness from manipulating the facial nerve uh, uh, can be permanent in 5% of the cases and uh, transient in 20%. And then these uh, other factors that can occur, it, it, what we refer to as ataxia, from manipulating the vestibular nerve or manipulating the cerebellum, a patient may feel a little bit unsteady in gait uh, and describe that as difficulty in gait or ataxia. Aseptic meningitis <clears throat> is a chemical meningitis, meaning that the patient didn't like the surgeon being in there there could be some blood products that got in and it creates basically a chemical meningitis. <clears throat> this is easily treated with steroids for a period of time and then does go away. Finally, uh, there is um, a risk for cerebral spinal fluid leak because we are drilling out the mastoid bone a little bit to get access. <clears throat> uh, we wax it aggressively, but there can be a communication. Uh, uh, again, this is uh, 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 relatively easily fixed, but we like to avoid it. And then because we are close to the 9th, 10th, and 11th cranial nerves, pr uh, primarily the 9th and 10th, uh, there can be hoarseness because the 10th nerve is responsible for <clears throat> innervating the vocal cord on the side that you're operating. So those are the major risk factors. Again, I, I'm listing them. Uh, 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 these are, are, are not common. I, as I said, the, the, the hearing loss is the more common when, we have, when you have that unfortunate circumstance where the, the blood vessel is going between the eighth nerve and the seventh nerve. Uh, but fortunately, that you know, occurs at the most about 50% of the time. Uh, with that, I will uh, say uh, thank you and open the floor to any questions that the audience might have. You can type them into Roseanne or you can uh, go off mute uh, and ask me directly. I have a question. Can you hear me? I have a question. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, what is the success rate for repeat uh, or redo of the procedure? 
I think that it's it, it's dependent upon you know, so uh, uh, I can think of two cases where I did decide to go back in and and that was uh, and the reasons for going back in was that on the first case was the patient had a giant vertebral artery that was really bending and twisting and uh, he he got relief for a while but then it came back. And when I, I got a follow-up MRI scan and I felt that, well, he's got recurrent symptoms, this is definitely the cause, uh, I can go back in and, and put some new, more felt in. Uh, you know, so that was a, uh, a successful result. And then uh, uh, another patient who had recurrence after a year, and when I looked at the MRI scan, it looked like there uh, was uh, still some opportunity to get a better vascular decompression. Uh, but by and large, if, a, if somebody has recurrence of the hemifacial spasm and the postoperative MRI scan demonstrates that the Teflon coated felt patty is in the appropriate spot and the blood vessel is, is marginated away from the nerve, uh, I'm not sure that uh, a, a re-exploration is going to be worth it. Again, I always leave that to the patient's discretion because they're obviously the individual living uh, with this uh, uh, situation. And uh, again, the, the oper operation per se is, is safe from a, uh, a, you know, a risk standpoint. Uh, and, and only the patient can tell you or tell me how much benefit they think they're going to derive from it. So it really depends upon what the post-operative MRI scan looks like uh, as to whether I think a re-exploration would be beneficial. If I may, I have another question. I mean, I personally have had um, two microvascular decompressions um, and they've both been unsuccessful and I don't want to get into my case, except that I know that I'm not a candidate for another um, a session and I am currently getting Botox injections um, where I had had them previously and they were not successful, but I'm going to a uh, more trained specialist for, for those. And I'm just wondering what that atrophy and over time, what is your experience with patients or would you not see them as a neurosurgeon as much over time, over the years? I've suffered with this for 11 years now. Yeah. Um, do well, you see, the, see in the patients? order, that, in the order that you're describing it, I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily see you. Where, where I've seen it is patients that have, you know, they've been afraid of surgery for, for their own personal reasons, and they've had 11 years of Botox. And, you know, what, what you see with that is the atrophy of the muscle and uh, the uh, slight asymmetry. Now, are there options to get over that? Uh, uh, you know, we have a facial reanimation team uh, that, that can help, help get through that if, it's, if, if, the, uh, if the cosmetic component, they can do some muscle grafting. Uh, yeah, so that's an option down the road. I guess the, my my further question is, um, over time with hemifacial spasm, for instance, if you've had it like 20, 25 years, does it start to lessen at any point in time? Um, uh, I have I have not seen it go away. It 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 it, it can be uh, it, it can be cyclical, as you know. You've lived with this long enough; it can get worse. It can get better. Uh, but I have to admit, you know, short of doing something, i.e. Botox or microvascular decompression, in my experience, I haven't seen it just, just dissipate. Now, again, I, uh, uh, you know, somebody 20 years, I haven't seen somebody 20 years out from repeated Botox before they come to me, you know. So I, uh, I, I, I would have to, you would have to talk with your specialist that's doing the Botox injections if they've been doing this for a long period of time. What's their long-term experience with repeated Botox injections? Okay, thank you. Sure. 
Dr. Stieg, I'm I'm curious about the small percentage of uh, patients who are are found not to have uh, vascular compression. Uh, has any um, further information come uh, about them and the cause of their hemifacial spasms? Well, in the absence in the absence of vascular compression, we're always looking for some other etiology. Like I said, a, a cyst, a tumor, MS. Uh, so yeah, I'm presuming your question is excluding those as part of the differential diagnosis as well, correct? Correct. Correct. You know, I mean, that's the one other reason for, uh, you know, thinking about exploring in individuals that don't have an apparent um, <clears throat> uh, uh, arterial vascular compression is that there can be venous compression as well, which you don't see as well on MRI scan. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll conclude. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I want to wish everybody a, uh, a blessed Thanksgiving holiday. It's my favorite holiday. I hope you all enjoy your family. Thank you all for coming. And to you, sir. Thank you.